That's me in those pictures. I'm Diane Grant, otherwise known as Diggy of Diggy's Diaspora. In the genealogy field, I would be classed as an unknown quantity. I'm not part of the next gen. I'm not 100% British. I'm not even that geographically aware outside of London. Yet, I'm a Londoner. Islington is where my heart lies. I'm not that into football, but when I'm asked, it's Arsenal all the way. By now, you're probably wondering what the title of my presentation means. So let me take you back a little to 1974. We moved into a house on Richmond Avenue in Barnsbury, Islington. Our house could be classed as madnesses to be in the middle of our street. It was also technically at one of the entry points to Richmond Crescent. While playing in the Crescent, we would interact with our neighbours, such as Mike, who worked at Sobel Centre and was the owner of Bruce, the dog, who used to terrify us by breaking through their living room window, or Angelo, who owned the garage, or Megan Les Cooper, who are our direct neighbours on the Crescent. They lived at number one, on the other side of the door. This house has become famous as this is where Tony Blair was living when he became Prime Minister. But I'm not political and the house has a bigger significance than that. In our garden, there was a small staircase which was attached to the party wall of number one and in that wall was a door. Meg would always relate to us the fact that our two houses were part of a boarding school with the door being used as ease of access between the two properties, the school being in 85 and dorms in number one. Let's take an even further step back to get a clearer view of where the houses are located. Islington was formed not only during a time of economic boom but also an impending boom within the population of the City of London. Provisions were made for the expanding middling classes of traders and merchants. This enabled them to move to an area close to the city with more space and a cleaner environment in which to live. The Thornhill family were from Yorkshire and over time acquired 86 acres in Islington, which is most of Barnsbury. Due to its proximity to the city, George Thornhill was approached around 1810 to lease his land. At that time, the land was mainly being used by dairy farmers. Joseph Kay, who was known for working for clients such as Lord Chichester and Lord Camden, joined the project as surveyor. In the period after the Second World War, the demographic of the area changed with more working class people moving into Islington. The houses which were initially one family habitats became filled to the brim as multiple occupant tenement housing and slums. Charles Booth organised a survey of London that took place during 1898-9 which depicted the poverty in London. The Booth poverty maps clearly show the demarcation of wealth and poverty in the Barnsbury area, the poorer areas being those nearer to the train track and heading towards King's Cross St Pancras. Number 1 and 85 were the last tranche of houses built in the development around 1854. Originally, the address of 85 was 13 Richmond Villas. This road, along with Matham Place, Richmond Terrace and Gainford Place, all became part of Richmond Road around 1867-70. Richmond Road's name was then changed to Richmond Avenue in 1938. The developments throughout Barnsbury have varying facades. The square of Barnsbury has a very uniform look throughout, with terrace housing around the perimeter of what were private gardens. Close to Richmond Crescent, literally at the end of Number One's garden, lies Thornhill Garden, which was created from the remaining piece of Thornhill's nursery land. It is the home of the local wall monument, which was bought after vigorous fundraising by the Vicar of Holy Trinity, along with the shrine housed in the church. The gardens also contained two air raid trench shelters during the Second World War, but most people preferred to stay home than frequent them. With hindsight, this may not have been a good idea due to the fact that Barnard Park, also known as Barnsby Park, was created due to the extensive bomb damage caused to Gainford Street, which is directly opposite 85, Sheen Grove and Boxwood Grove. Now, I won't go into the story of the frozen head found in the men's toilet in this park, but if you get a chance, do a search on it. As young as I was when this happened, I can clearly recall being terrified for a moment. This, however, did not stop my siblings and I from using the park. Richmond Road, which leads to Richmond Crescent, has a multitude of stars, with the most photographed being numbers 46 to 72, which were built by William Dennis. I have the distinctive figures of sphinxes and obelisks stationed at the doorway of these properties. Number one does not have such dramatic features, but 85 has quite a striking doorway, which was depicted in a book called Period Details. In 1964, the term gentrification was coined by Ruth Glass to describe the process by which the middle class was swooping into inner city London areas and upgrading the property there. Barnsbury has become renowned for its spiralling house prices and for the driving out of council tenants and the working class. I know, this is becoming like an episode of Columbo. You know who committed the crime, you just don't know how. Yes, there was indeed an educational facility at this location. The census returns show these properties to be in constant occupation. Number one went from a single family dwelling in 1861 
to multiple occupant household from 1881, which was on trend for the area at that time. Number 85 stayed as a single family dwelling throughout. Both properties were stated to be uninhabited at the time of the 1911 census, which helped to direct my focus for this research. The 1912 street directory is the first time that there is a listing for 85 and the centre located there is called the Barnsbury Girls Club, run by Miss Kay Galway, Lady Superintendent. In the 1923 street directory, the entry now shows the Elizabeth Whitelaw Reed training homes at 85, which is substantiated by the 1921 census where Kate Galway enumerates 13 girls and three matrons in occupation. In all paperwork online, there has not been any mention of the club also being located at 1 Richmond Crescent. However, on reading the 1930 rate book for Islington, there was finally a breakthrough with the White Law Reed Boys and Girls Club being registered at both of the properties. I finally have the definitive proof needed to state Meg's worth to be actual fact. Now the fact has been proven, what exactly is this club and who are the people involved? Following the death of her brother, who was a rector in California, Kate Galway received a visit from Mrs. Elizabeth Nils Reed, a close friend of her brother's, who she had previously met. During this visit, Kate and Mrs. Reed conceived the idea which would laterally become the Barnsbury Boys and Girls Club. So who was Mrs. Reed? She was the wife of Whitelaw Reed, who had been the editor-in-chief of the New York Tribune. He was also the US Vice President candidate with presidential candidate Ben Harrison and part of the Peace Commission for the Spanish-American War. He was then stationed in England and as US ambassador up to his death in 1912. Elizabeth's rap sheet is just as impressive as her husband's, with her acting as head of the nursery division of the American Red Cross during the Spanish-American War. During World War II, Elizabeth would become the chair of the American Red Cross in London. The club started on the 31st of October 1910 in Almeida Street in Islington with 10 members. By the time Kate retired in 1939, the club had grown to 1,400 members. The facility was too small at Almeida Street, so after nine months, they finally found a suitable house to inhabit. Kate deemed 85 to be the biggest house in the locality, with the advantage of being well-built, so showing no signs of decay. The club was not a mixed club, but would on occasion have mixed activities, such as social evenings, lectures and discussions, dramatic and singing classes, and on Sunday afternoons, Bible classes. Due to the rapid growth of the club, the boys were moved to 62 Richmond Road and would mix on certain evenings with the girls at 85. Soon after, a training home was started at 85 with three girls from the club who desired to go into service. The club then moved to Clowsley Street in the old school building, which belonged to Holy Trinity Church, so as to be able to facilitate the home at 85. A day in the life at the training home started at 6 o'clock with clearing the rooms needed and breakfast prepared for 8 o'clock. 10 minutes was then spent in the garden, followed by prayers. House and kitchen work was done till dinner time, then 10 more minutes in the garden. The girls would work in the house doing odds and ends such as washing up and cleaning after the morning's cooking. They then attended the sewing room to help make their outfits, along with household and personal mending. By 5 p.m., recreation time begins. 5.30 is tea, and afterwards, in the winter, they spend time in the sewing room, or in the summer, they use the garden. 8 p.m. is bedtime. Matron Williams stated that this training home was unlike any other in England. This was due to the kindness and generosity of Mrs. Reed. 227 girls passed through the home up until 1931, when the training home closed due to financial constraints after Mrs. Reed died. Even though Mrs. Reed left an endowment for the centre and her daughter, Lady Jean Templeton Ward, wife of the Honourable John H. Ward, who, as a side note, was royal equerry to four kings of England, would be carrying on in her stead, they had to decide to scale back and close the training home. The club, however, carried on at Cloudley Street until 1960, when the building was sold. Homage was paid to Reed Galway and Maud Alice Bartlett for their charitable work with this club. Three tablets were erected in their honour in the Holy Trinity Church in Barnsbury with sentiments such as We thank God upon every remembrance of her, for Mrs. Reed, to Kate and Maud in ever loving and grateful memory. To conclude, I would like to express the following. Meg, my neighbour, died on the 5th of March 1982, less than a month after my family moved overseas. She passed on my father's birthday and six days after my eighth birthday. This fact I only learned when I started this research. What was even more amazing was the fact that my son and Meg also share a birthday. Meg, you are still fondly thought of by us all, and I thank you for starting me on this journey for my first house study.